This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by the very interesting shirts, as well as the other Shadowversity shirts, which are also interesting, they're just not the very interesting shirts. That might sound confusing, but if you go check out the shirts, it'll make a lot more sense. Available through Teespring, link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and another YouTube channel called Simple History have recently made a video on knights. And after watching it, there has been one or two things that I feel they've gotten wrong, which is why I'm making this video to offer a correction or two, or three, or four. But before we get into it, I do want to talk a little bit about this reply video format. You see, I was a bit reluctant to make this response. And the reason is, after all my other reply videos, there's always been a bit of a bad taste left in my mouth, and it's the result of the potentially negative repercussions of making them. You see, I, I've never liked uh, the fact that reply videos tend to make the person making the reply video uh, seem smarter, like they are, they are able to point stuff out that people got wrong, therefore I am so intelligent and look at me. Uh, I never have liked that element of the reply video format, and even when done with complete sincerity, there there is that underlining kind of implication that I don't like. The other result of reply videos which I don't like are the negative reactions that often come to uh, the people in which the reply videos are being made to. I tried to be as polite and encouraging as I possibly could in my reply to the MatPat video and unavoidably it still caused a kind of negative criticism being sent towards Matt. Now I think that can come as a result of how incorrect some of the statements can be made which causes the negative reaction, so not necessarily me correcting them, but of course when I do point them out, and I share how egregiously false some of these assertions can be, the natural and hard to avoid result for people when they hear that is to think, well that person doesn't know what they're talking about, and they're idiots, and they're not idiots. And so like I said, for those reasons I was a bit reluctant to make this video, but then I remembered something that I've been doing for a good couple of weeks now, maybe even a month or so, and that's in really enjoying the reply videos that are made to me. So this is not me making reply videos correcting other people, but this is other people making reply videos to me correcting me. And most of them are really, really good. I really enjoy them so much so that I've been using the community tab. It's a new beta feature on YouTube. Not every creator has them. I've been given access to it and I've been using it with wonderful results. And so if you look on the main, my main Shadowversity YouTube channel, you'll see a community tab on the front page. And if you click on it, you will see kind of Facebook-like posts that I've been making there, uh, sharing reply videos that other people on YouTube have been making to me that I found particularly insightful, respectful, added to the conversation, and in some cases even changed my mind. Now, of course, I don't share every single reply video that's made to me. I do that with the ones that I feel were uh, really good, respectful, share, and sometimes even if they're not respectful, but they're just sharing good logical facts and uh, I agree with them, I'll even share them as well. The ones that I don't share are the ones that misunderstood my original meaning and uh, they're not actually sharing a valid argument or response. Now, that is generally due to misunderstandings, no malicious intent on their behalf, but I rather share those replies that I feel have more merit than other ones. And I guess it'll be up to you to figure out if my own reply videos have merit, but I do encourage you to check out those posts I make on the community tab and those videos that I've referenced, and of course I'm going to continue doing it because there's some really good ones out there, and of course I have linked all those reply videos in the description down below. So the positivity that can come out of reply videos I feel can in large measure come out of how creators respond to them when a reply video is made about them, but also how the original videos are made as well. They should never be done maliciously, there should always be respect given, and the person and making the reply video should endeavour to their best ability to represent the other person's views as accurately as possible. And with those things done, I think reply videos can end up being a win-win for every party involved, and especially you, the viewer, because you end up being more informed. And that's the, the main reason why I've always ever done these reply, reply videos, is because I want people to know the truth or get close as, as possible as I can lead them to the truth because I'm not the gatekeeper, I get things wrong all the time as well. I just endeavour to help myself and other people along to the best ability that I can. And this brings us back to Simple History and the video that they made on the night. I love YouTube channels like Simple History. I feel it is very beneficial and even needed to summarise history into small little easily absorbed snidbits so people who are not full-blown history nuts and stuff like that are still able to be educated on these things in a manner that they can learn and enjoy much easier. And you might say, ah, but what if they misinform people about certain subjects? Because when you try and approach a very broad kind of view of history 
history and you talk on areas that you're not as versed in, of course, there is a much higher chance of making mistakes. Well, my own opinion on this is that it's actually much better, okay, for a person to know the incorrect thing on a subject, as long as it doesn't lead to any, you know, danger or harm, it's better for them to know the incorrect thing on a subject than knowing nothing about the subject at all. Because knowing that incorrect thing will often lead them to learning the correct thing. And the fact that Simple History's channel and my channel as well are able to inform people on the larger majority with correct information because most of the stuff they say is correct, all right, that certainly means that they're doing far more good than the little bits of misinformation and mistakes that happen along the way because we're all human, we're all infallible, and if you feel you're justified in criticizing other people for making mistakes, you should criticize yourself because everyone does it. Now we can get into the video specifically, but all those things were very important for me to outline, and I really hope everyone who watches this video will consider the things I've said and take them on board. The video actually starts off pretty good. I really like the fact that Simple History brought up the benefices of the Carolingian era, because the genesis of the knight really does seem to be from this period in time, and more specifically, from the Norman invasion with the mounted warriors that were used by William the Conqueror, and they were called the Norman Knights. Here is where we get into some complexity though, because I actually don't fully like that the Norman knights are called knights, because I don't think they are knights in the classic sense of what we think of when we use the word knight. I've made a whole video on that, in fact, did knights exist before the medieval period? And on top of that, there's a great reply video uh, replying to me, say, sharing some of the things that they felt they got wrong by Clausewitz. So I'll link that in the description as well. For reply videos, they're great. So for myself, I generally feel that saying knights existed in Carolingian times and even during the Norman Conquest is far too great a generalization. But that is more a subjective thing. I'll get to some of the areas in the videos that I can more objectively say are incorrect. And the first big one is the statements about chivalry. Knights followed a code of behavior called chivalry, modeled on Christian virtues. Such principles included a vow to protect the weak and poor honor women, never lie, show bravery, and to defend the church and king. The chivalric code also ensured respect between fellow knights. This is actually something that I've needed amongst several times in the past because chivalry is a very misunderstood thing. But what's funny is that the incorrect idea of chivalry is very prolific. So many people think when they think of chivalry, they think of the classic, you know, idea of the code of chivalry. And I think the confusion comes from the fact that chivalry was a very big thing, very much existed in the medieval period, and knights took it very seriously. So you always have to talk about chivalry because that's very much true, but as to what chivalry was, that's when people get it wrong. I've even taken issue with the lectures from The Great Courses Plus done by Professor Philip DeLita, who overall his lectures are really good, but his statements on chivalry fell into this incorrect uh, summarization as well. And that might actually be because those lectures are so old, okay? Uh, with additional research, more theory being done by historians and stuff like that, a better understanding of chivalry has emerged. And you can read about this better understanding of chivalry in the book Chivalry in Medieval England by Nigel Saul. And to summarize it, because it is something I've said many times before, and I have made a whole video on this subject alone, just chivalry. And so if you want the detailed version, please do go watch that video. But chivalry was a subjective thing, okay, and was often different dependent on whoever was looking upon it, okay? One lord will have a different uh, version of chivalry compared to another lord, a knight will see chivalry differently to the regular common folk, and then the clergy would have a different version of chivalry as well. Chivalry essentially means the qualities that make a knight good at his job, and whatever the individual person felt made a knight good at his job, that was what chivalry was to them. And so if that meant showing no mercy on the infidel or anyone that dared give them the slightest offense, kill him. But if that also meant always showing mercy and fair play and true, you know, righteous combat, well, that, one, that would be chivalry to someone else, and those two concepts of chivalry directly contradict one another. So people generally raise the more idyllic, noble form of chivalry because that was what was romanticized in literature, uh, and these are this is a literature generally by Chrétien de Troyes and Raymond Lull, and they are not actually describing what chivalry was, they were describing what they felt chivalry should be like. Not what knights were like, but how they felt knights should behave. And by the very fact that they felt 
felt need to write this down, okay, actually implies that most knights didn't follow it, because if all the knights were following this form of chivalry as prescribed by Chrétien de Troyes and Raymond Lull, there would have been no need to write it down because everyone knew what it was. We need to remember that knights in most cases were pragmatists, okay, over idealists. And they did what they needed to do, what their lord ordered and wanted them to do, and to find success. So that's what I'll say on chivalry. Please do go check out those references if you would like further reading or watch my video, so that's not reading, but anyway, if, if you want more information on the subject. The invention of the stirrup had made it possible for mounted warriors to charge at the enemy effectively. Ah, the invention of the stirrup. This one is a hairy one because this is indeed one of those very things that I have gotten wrong in the past. In fact, I say the exact thing in my chivalry video, okay? The one that I just referenced, I say that it was the invention of the stirrup. Same thing here. But guess what? Later on, I got corrected on that and I learned that's incorrect. So I put tags on my chivalry video and I made a new video correcting that called uh, was it like the invention of shock cavalry warfare I forget the title it's uh, I'll link it but in that video I explain ah the truth about this is that the stirrup actually uh, had very little effect or uh, you know in the development of impact warfare or mounted charges in fact by virtue of how the mounted charge happens okay people you generally say that the stirrup enables you to brace your body weight on the horse more effectively transfer more uh, force and stuff like that that's actually not really true and quite dangerous if you did it that way. You could possibly break your legs. Uh, more often than not, you need to roll with the impact to absorb it so you don't actually injure yourself. And as a result, your feet end up flying up. If you watch people actually doing jousting, they will get knocked back, all right? And their feet are flying up and the stirrup is actually not being used to brace their weight or hold them in the saddle. And the other thing that debunks this uh, stirrup misconception is that mounted charges can be done without stirrups very effectively. There's this uh, whole study that a guy has done and uh, uh, I've linked the paper on my video on the stirrup where uh, he, go, he recreates it and is able to do full blown mounted charges without stirrups and even without a saddle. And then you have the mounted horsemen that existed before the medieval period as well that did mounted charges with spears in hand and they were the cataphracts. Cataphracts? Cataphracts? <laughs> That's a word I have to Cataphract or cataphract. <laughs> Stirrup primarily is an assist in mounting the horse, getting on top of it. All right. That's why they were invented. And then they can be very useful in pulling, pushing yourself up off the saddle. OK, and keeping your balance in some of those regards, but not necessarily in, char in the mounted charge. Now, I'm not saying that they don't help in little ways here and there. What I'm saying is that mounted charges can be done very effectively without stirrups. And so saying that they're required completely incorrect. While plate armor protected the knights from enemy swords and hammers, it was heavy and limited mobility. Properly made medieval full plate armor limits mobility to a far lesser extent than many people ever talk about or say when they say. In fact, it's so little that it's more accurate to say that this type of armor doesn't limit mobility because whenever someone says it limits mobility a little bit, people it generally just takes the limits mobility thing and it's heavy and cumbersome. And so to give people the correct idea as to how little that limitation actually is, it is generally more accurate to say armor basically doesn't limit mobility at all. Properly made, correct armor, because it's distributed over the whole body. Tests have been done. Uh, this is uh, something that I bring up many times in many other debunk debunking videos. The medieval knight was able to maintain high mobility and high speed even wearing full plate armor. Of course, it's not to say that it's like you're not wearing it at all, all right? You will tire much quicker in wearing it because you are carrying more weight. It's about, you know, 60 pounds. It's about the same weight as what the standard army guy wears in his backpack on his back. But it's not just hanging on the shoulders. Like I said, it's distributed over the whole body. And so you can go running in armor, you can go climbing in armor, you can perform acrobatic feats in armor. And of course, you can get on a horse unassisted in armor. On the real battlefield, siege warfare would be more common. So this next point is not directly addressing something that is said in the video, but rather something is shown. Now, I know the animation is not meant to be perfectly accurate because it's very simplified. And it's the fact that they show catapults being used in sieges. And it's funny, this is coming off the back of a video I've just made. Because generally, like, this is the area of interest that I have. Medieval arms, weapons, castles, warfare, and stuff like that. And so whenever someone gets something wrong, 
Like generally, I've already made a whole video on that subject, and so I can reference those and just speak kind of very generally in a summarized version of this video here. And if you want more information, you can go check out those videos. And so the catapult thing made the whole video, and generally catapults, they were not common on the medieval battlefield, especially in sieges. Uh, in fact, they're a very ineffective weapon to be used in sieges. Catapult specifically, or what you think of is a, cata a catapult, because what most, what most people think of as a catapult isn't really a catapult. And if you want to know the answer to that, hey, I've got a video. You can check it out. If you want, you don't really have to, but I mean, there's just a video there, I and mean, you'll probably enjoy it. You know, just, just saying. After the siege, they would pillage and slaughter the enemy population. The knights would pillage and slaughter the enemy population. Okay, there's a bit more to unpack in this one because it happened, right? But it's being said like that was the thing that happened most often by the knights. And uh, no, first of all, no, that wasn't. It didn't happen in every single instance. But of course, it did happen. But when it did happen, there needs to be under uh, the context needs to be understood a little bit more. All right, so the context. What would generally happen when a siege started is a parley would take place, okay, between the besiegers and the defenders. And the, be the besiegers would generally say something like this, surrender right now and let us take over the castle. And if you do that, we will spare everyone's lives. Not a single life will be lost and you will be free to go on your way or be taken into captivity one or the other, generally. That's a tough option and the defenders, they had the option, they can surrender now or they can try and defend it. But then an ultimatum would be stated. And the knights, or well, not knights, I'm saying generally, common language, right? It gets confusing. The besiegers would say, if you do not surrender now, we are going to take over your castle. And when we do, we will kill every single one of you. This is where we get into the tricky kind of situation. Because if you want that threat to have any weight at all for the next time when you besiege someone, you need to follow through with it. If you don't follow through with the threat, the defenders know that, well, you're not going to kill us. It means nothing. So we're going to fight to, you know, the last man standing or when, to when you take the castle. And they're going to kill as many of you as possible. So the fact that when the besiegers took a city or a castle and uh, they did some pretty darn brutal stuff, killing and pillaging everywhere, right? That was actually often seen on their side. And I'm not saying this is a good thing or trying to justify it. I'm just saying what their uh, point of view would be. And from their point of view, it's actually a form of retaliation for the lives that they were forced to lose in taking the castle by force. Because if they just surrendered, my friend who had to, you know, fight to take this city going up against the walls wouldn't have been killed. And so, yeah, that was your fault. That's on you. And this is the appropriate punishment as they saw it. And then the next time they went to besiege a castle, they have far more weight behind that statement. And they say, if you don't surrender, we are going to kill every single one of you. And you have to remember that there are many sieges that resulted in the defenders just surrendering. Surrendering, all right? Uh, there are many sieges in which the defenders won. And so that's the difficulty on the, uh, the defenders' side because, one, uh, this is an aggressive, uh, you know, attacking force uh, and they're trying to take your land by force, which is not a particularly no noble righteous thing unless, you know, warfare, what justifies warfare is a whole other complex subject. But anyway, the defenders, they don't want to give up their home or their city or whatever. Uh, they all want to defend it. And you need to understand, medieval defenses like this on cities and castles were very effective, okay? And many times the defenders are able to win, so this is a high gamble, okay? So just to say that knights loved pillaging and slaughtering everyone and they took over a, a siege is a very uh, oversimplified statement that requires a bit more nuance and context to be given in the thing, and sometimes that didn't happen, okay? Or, like there are cases in sieges where the besiegers won, they actually stormed it, all right, and then they let the people go free, okay? Or took them into captivity but didn't slaughter everyone in it. So yeah, there's more to it. From the end of the 15th century, new weapons such as the crossbow and gunpowder firearms and the rise of standing armies eventually made the role of the knight more obsolete. Alrighty, alright, crossbows and even to a lesser extent, firearms didn't cause the knights to become more obsolete, okay? Knights were still around and being employed during the time crossbows were used for like a very long time, okay? And uh, also firearms. And in fact, if you really want to try and point out the ranged weapon that had a larger effect on the role of the knight on the medieval battlefield is actually the bow. And it was the uh, fallout of both Cressy and Agincourt, where it was seen, and it wasn't really the effectiveness of the bow, it was that the employment of a, of a state-run military, okay, because these were actually uh, more common soldiers being, you know, raised and run by King Henry, 
Henry V, I think, that that could be so effective. And fielding a knight was a much more costly and complicated endeavor. But common peasant guy who you tell, look, every Sunday train with a bow. That's my new rule in my kingdom. Everyone on a Sunday, practice with a bow. And when a war comes, hey, does it, is anyone good with a bow? Great, I'll hire you as an archer. Come join my army. And they don't have to be a knight, they don't need to be paid more or anything like that, but the archers were paid a decent amount in the army. Uh, they join, and then they have a really effective fighting force. We're fielding knights in this more complicated social kind of construct thing. It costs a lot more money and harder to uh, get them to do exactly what you want, when you want, and stuff like that. And as a result of that, people are saying, oh, yeah, all right, the, 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 these are more organized, uh, you know, it was armies with, made with common folk. That's actually pretty effective because those knights got wrecked in Agincourt. And so the last part in Simple History's statement, that it was standing armies that were fielded by the state, actually was the thing that started to cause the decline of the knight. That's correct. Uh, the part about crossbows and firearms, not nearly so much. But you need to understand Understand, knights never disappeared from the scene of history. They still exist today, all right? Uh, especially, e like, even more so when the states, like kingdoms, nations, whatever government systems they have, are fielding their own armies, generally, especially uh, the early Renaissance and even, oh, gee, even up until like World War I, commanders, okay, the, the people running, captains or whatever, people running these armies were generally knighted, all right? And so the knights were still there. Uh, they just weren't the common foot soldier. They were the guys running the things, but that wasn't really a military rank per se. They would have a military rank and of a side note, they would be knighted because knighthood, all right, it, it evolved, but when I say evolved, I should really say it devolved because knighthood became, uh, it started off as a military thing, a purely military thing. Uh, the original word for knight, chevalier, just meant horseman. If you're a horseman, uh, you're basically a knight. And then this other social element came in, I was very important with it because it was the structure of the medieval period and the use of vassalage as a social system. And then you have the second component, which is a social kind of honorific that was attached to the military component, which is what you get the, where you get the classical knight. But then the military component left. The thing that the knight originally was, just a military thing, that thing left and it was, and knighthood even to this day, solely remained as a social honorific. But it still certainly stayed around. So saying, you know, knights and knighthoods is a, is a complex thing because of course the classic medieval knighted soldier warrior, that became, that disappeared. But though you could kind of say they still existed all the way up until like World War One, yeah. But the concept of knighthood and the social honorific, it evolved, it changed, and it's still around to this day. And there we go, these have been the corrections that I've wanted to make to Simple History's video about the medieval knight. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed guys, and honestly, if you are interested in the, the easy, kind of casual to watch, easy to absorb, the little snippet kinds of history, stuff like that, it's a great YouTube channel to subscribe to. I really encourage you to go check out more of their content, and I encourage you to come back to see maybe some of their other videos, some of the things, you know, lovely down below, if you're interested. But until that time, farewell.